Okay. <clears throat> so we would like uh, to welcome today with us in Zoom um, architects. Should we wait for Alison? She's coming. Okay. Architects Quan Fonglino. It's an architectural office which is based in Chicago, United States. Um, there, um, we have met with Alison and Lapchi uh, when they worked in Herzog de Miron in Basel. We worked together with them. And then they have uh, quitted and made their uh, architectural company, moved to Chicago where they successfully practice and teach in a university, uh, if I'm not mistaken, IIT, right? Right. In Illinois Institute of Technology. Um, they're both graduates of Harvard GSD University and uh, um, with no further delay, we welcome them for a half an hour midi arshi to, to our studio. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Can you see our screen? I don't know why you cannot see the full screen. Are you seeing the full screen right now? No. Yeah. You can see that I think it shows the side things. Why isn't the thing? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you again for uh, inviting over to the of midterm review and also showing our work. And we always we always start from the term enjoy architecture is actually perhaps pretty naive. And also after you may be staying all night uh, working on your project and still why are we thinking about enjoy architecture? I think it's a certain innocent about when we start opening our practice. We, we actually opened our practice four years ago. We wish that we were here in Geneva Review, but we are in Chicago right now. And we, we kind of work with uh, many different projects, but mostly it's not built. And on the left side here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, that is the ongoing project. On the middle, the two is the Artmore house that we just finished, and the Swiss counselor that we work with, collaborate with HXF Architect in Basel, is this new Swiss consulate in Chicago. And we did an exhibition in Basel as well and in New York. And we also did a lot of competition that we won a couple, but those are idea competition, it's not for build building. And when we first opening our office, we, me and Alison actually never worked together and we actually doesn't have any commission when we start our, our practice. And we find it is a very good way for us to, to test, can we actually work together? And since we are also married, so we kind of want to use the competition to see, can we work together? And a lot of competition in, this, in America is actually not deal, it's just an idea competition. And this competition is about a tabletop apartment. The idea is we see the interesting about the tectonic about a table, like on the left side, a circle table, a diamond table, and a square table. But how can we actually stack a table as a four slab and a column? And the idea is this simple idea about this model system and allow us to kind of test the idea on a New York City in between lots to as a affordable housing, as a model system. And since then, we also make this uh, model here to show that how this model system can aggregate. It's not just one lot in New York, but also can be extended as a horizontal pier type to a tower type. But also the idea is how this model system is a very standard, only three different models, but able to perform a different variation through the model system. And the next project we want to show is another competition that we won, it's an idea competition as well. And in, this is in Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, the apartment is quite flat. It's basically one room next to another room and next to another room. 
But we were thinking about why in Hong Kong, everyone think they are living in the tower, but actually they live very horizontally. And the idea is how we are thinking, what happened if every unit is like a tower, that all the programs is stacked on top of each other. So when you're on the street, you can actually point to your friend and your relative to say, this is where we live. This, this is the tower I live, this is the tower you live. And the way to think about this is, is kind of, uh, again, the model system to think about how do we live vertically from the living room, kitchen, dining, to a living room, kitchen, to a sleeping room, to a library, to a shower room. The idea is how can we live vertically and no longer live horizontally. And, but the reality is we kind of doing competition to kind of fantasize what we want to do. And, but at the same time, when we come back to Chicago, this is the reality. This is the reality we are facing that on the right side is a book is called the book of the home plan that is actually you can buy in in home depot in america but in, in switzerland maybe in ob that you can buy this book for like ten dollar and then you can ask the builder to say i want this plan i want this uh, that plan so this is what we're facing when we start opening an office what is architecture anymore we kind of have the fantasy side but at the same time we have to deal with the reality and what we find interesting is on the left side, we kind of actually trace over a lot of the plan. And if you want a small house, it's about 1,500 square feet. Sorry, I cannot convert it to square meter right now, but the big one is about 10,000 square feet. So it's ranging really differently and the shape is quite interesting. But all this program is about necessity. It's about if you want five bedroom, you just add more bedroom. If you want three bathroom, you just add more square footage but there's not so much architecture concept between the plan. And we approach the Swiss Architecture Museum. We say, we are interesting about the Chicago, home, uh, the American home plan. And we have something interesting that we want to title called smuggle, uh, smuggling architecture. That since perhaps it's very unfortunate, not so many people is interesting about architecture in general, but the idea is it doesn't have to be everyone interested, but as long as we're interested and we can smuggle in it and to show what's the power of architecture could be, I think that's the goal. And we did three really large model in the Swiss Architecture Museum and also with some, some sort of research on the back to show how architecture is still relevant, how architecture can provide something that is more than a generic home plan from the books. And this is the three plan of the house that we are looking at from 1,500 square feet to 3,000 square feet. And when you look at the plan, it's quite functional. I would say it's almost perfectly to live in. There's nothing wrong with them. But the problem for us is this is not what, what we learn from school. This is not we think architecture needs, but we think the architecture still can provide something that is useful for the society that we're thinking the organization is not strong enough. The, the adaptability of the home plan is not um, very flexible. We were thinking that what happened if we smuggle architecture in the plan. And this is the first plan that we smuggled. When you first look at the plan, it actually look like the plan that I just showed you in the previous page. But I don't know if you can see my cursor, but when here I, we start cutting to an envelope, an envelope that you can go from room to room to room. The idea is the organization is no longer using as a hallway, but it's how can we use one room to another room to another room. That this perhaps that becomes the organization for the home. And this view is a model shot of the, the plan that we just showed you. When you first look at it, it's really strange. That is not going to look like any American home that you look at because we kind of cut through this existing plan with the new envelope to it. The power of this is we can see from this bedroom on the foreground, we can all look all the way across to another garage to the backyard. And through this organization, when you go to the living room, you start to see it's quite generic. It looks like some sort of American home. But then you start to look at the corner here on the right side of the door, you start to see that something is little, something actually transformed that is no longer a typical uh, American home plan, but we kind of already smuggled architecture to it. 
smart cloning architecture doesn't have to be people have doesn't have to be no it doesn't have to be star architecture but somehow what we believe that we can transform this space and on another view here this is the master bedroom looking at another suburban house in america this is a quite generic view that you, you cannot see the difference the, the idea is you don't have to see the difference in every single space but if the architecture you become an organization element maybe we just quickly show quickly show you two more of the plan this is another plan that we actually smuggled already and when you first look at it again it doesn't look so strange but the idea is how can we make this plan relevant and what we have been learning for the last four years the co-living and share living is actually become very important in america as well instead of thinking about this as a as a typical family, nuclear family with a dad and mom and two children, who are thinking about what happened to become a co-living house. That we see three cluster of living space, that two bedroom at one cluster, another cluster, one bedroom on the right side and one bedroom on the bottom. And then whatever that in the middle, in the between space become a topic kind of co-living space, kitchen, dining, library, living room space that they can share a three, we become a three unit family, three unit house. And this wheel here is showing that this in between space that you can see the living room and the fireplace and the library and the library in the foreground that is separate the three cluster of unit. And the unit is one in the background here, one bedroom. And another view showing this in between space to show the library, the, the dining and the kitchen as a topic area for this co living unit that. On the on the right and the left is the is the living for the two other families. Wait wait wait, we don't see. Uh, we have some uh, interruption. Uh, what? Oh. Wait a wait. second. I interrupt you. Hold on. Okay. I think it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Please continue, Lapchi. Okay, great. The last house we want to show you, this one also is already smuggled. And it may be a little bit more obvious that you can see those diamond shapes is aggregating in the suburban American home. And what we call this diamond shaped room is called the anti room that is no longer served as a main purpose but it's about a almost like a waiting room that almost like a vestibule before you go into the house that from a from a dining room you have an anti room before you go to the bedroom and then the toilet you have an anti room to go back to the hallway or maybe the, the from a dine from a formal dining room to the kitchen you have another anti room then maybe this could be a pantry space could be could be a space that before another activity can start. And this, this picture is showing this kind of layering effect of the empty room that all the room have a, has, have a very specific purpose, but those empty room allow the, the user that can have a different activity between the very formal purpose to it. And some of the real, as you can see that you look really generic, but when you look closer, you start to see an empty room on the right and on the left side as well. And you can see an empty room between the library and the formal living room. Another empty room from the dining room to the kitchen. And those empty rooms is really about it's become a room to breathe. That is no longer that one program has to be next to it, but there's some kind of breathing space from one to another. And you can see the left on the right the empty room as well. Um, so I'll talk about um, a project we just completed called Ardmore House. Um, it was our first um, new construction project that we completed uh, late last year. And um, the idea of this house actually is tied to our practice. We are looking to be an architecture practice that is both commission-based and also initiating our own development project. So this is actually a, um, a development project of ours. Um, and a lot of the ideas for this house we took from the competition housing project that we entered, um, but wanted to test them out um, at a scale that we could work with um, locally on a typical Chicago lot. 
Um, so we we bought what is actually considered a, a a really bad lot in Chicago. It's off of the alleyway, um, and the alleyway is where um, all of the uh, garbage trucks come and go. It's very noisy, not so private. Um, so these were all concerns that we had to deal with when addressing this home. And so our idea was to flip how you traditionally live um, on a Chicago lot in a single family home, where normally you have your uh, kitchen living dining on the first floor and um, all of your bedrooms on the second floor. So we really inverse that typical domestic section here. Um, so this is a, a view of the alleyway condition along the home and how we decided we wanted to open up the, the top half of the home to allow um, a lot of light and also create a new type of uh, a contemporary way of living where people gather together um, and the bedrooms where you spend the least amount of time are kind of tucked away. Um, so this is just describing the typical Chicago context where all the garages are in the back. So you have this alleyway condition um, then and are more houses along the side there. Um, the longest side is facing the alleyway. Um, so you can see this here along the alleyway where it's facing garages on one side, a parking lot, the back of balconies here. Um, and we've arranged the facade so that all of the light is brought in from the upper level and it's very distinctive and um, uh, minimized where we're bringing in views and light on the first level, which is really just one large picture window along the alleyway. And this is along what we call an interior courtyard. Um, maybe I'll go back to this in <laughs> a second. Um, so we, because this is a, a very small scale neighborhood, we were really concerned with how the presence of this home would fit into the context. Um, and we didn't want it to be this large, overwhelming, um, bulk of a project. And so we wanted to figure out how to break that up somehow. And so um, one day, um, Lapchi saw his favorite car on the road <laughs> that we cannot afford and um, thought that it was a really good idea, this, this two-tone system. Um, Range Rovers, as you, as you know, are really large cars and quite massive, but by kind of breaking it up into two zones um, with two different colors, it, it minimizes the mass of the building. And so um, we quickly did a Photoshop on some of our te test models to see how that would look and really liked the effect. Um, we then told Lachie's brother, who is um, an engineer about this, and he said, don't ever tell anyone that story. Um, you, should you should tell everyone uh, you looked at a Rothko painting instead. Um, so we really like that kind of uh, dialogue that um, an engineer is telling us how we should talk about a project and shouldn't say something like we looked at a Range Rover. Um, okay. I think so. Now you can continue. Have some pop up windows which break your, but we can continue now. Okay. Um, so, so we really like this effect in the end that um, we have the, the, the gray tone of the concrete basement that also kind of works with the alleyway asphalt context. Um, then we, we split level one in half um, with gray Akoya wood and then the top half is black um, to, to break up the volume of the home. Um, so, so we work a lot in model and um, often do a lot of animations with our models to, to see the use of the home. Um, and the idea here is really that it's a, quite cellular on the bottom floor and all of the bedrooms are pushed towards the neighboring building where you receive less light and you spend less time there anyway or you're there when it's nighttime so you don't need a lot of light. And we're really taking advantage of, of being along an alleyway where the longest side of the house can receive the most light. Um, and that's where all of the communal areas of the home are. Um, so the, the house is really symmetrical between front and back 
three bedrooms off of the interior courtyard. We call this an interior courtyard and tried to create different spaces along this place. We, we in all of our housing projects, we generally try to erase the corridor um, because we don't really see this as a useful space. Um, so we try to double this space as something else always. So there's like a, a reading nook here, a library nook. Um, and then this is a animation uh, looking through the first level of the project. Um, so this is a view in the uh, interior courtyard, um, looking from the front of the house to the back of the house, and you can see all the way up to the second floor as well. Um, so this space really bridges the two levels together. Um, coming back to Chicago, it, it was important to us to work with local building and construction methods. Um, so we were really fascinated by the Chicago balloon frame and wanted to highlight that on the facade. Um, so a Chicago balloon frame means that the framing is continuous from the bottom to the top of, of a wall instead of being cut in between um, with a beam. Um, so this west wall is a typical Chicago balloon frame. And you can see all the wood and framing that went into um, forming this space as is typical of, of American homes. And um, this is a view looking up between the courtyard, the curving courtyard on the right hand side and um, the upper level on the other side. And so we vaulted the space of level two to, to create as kind of much air and space for the second floor as possible, um, but divided the space by four different trusses that are holding the home together. And each of these trusses work to create a distinct atmosphere on the upper level. Um, so on this area here, this is the living room. Um, between these two trusses here, this is uh, the powder room that receives, that receives natural light into a skylight or the glass ceiling is on the bathroom there. This is the dining room here. And then there are skylights above the island area. And then finally, this is the kitchen area. Um, so the plan is quite open um, to all of the spaces, yet the trusses overhead try to distinguish the spaces themselves. So you can see um, the kind of succession of, of trusses to distinguish the different spaces. Um, when we were building this, the contractor was really worried about spanning this far and only having four trusses. So our structural engineer had to come and okay the building before it was, before the bracing was taken down and he found it was fine. Um, and then this is an image looking from the kitchen towards the front of the house um, with the successive trusses. And then uh, this is looking out over the alleyway um, to the surrounding urban context. You can see the back of the, the balconies of apartment buildings across the alleyway and kind of the old tree context. Um, then I'll just show quickly um, a couple projects um, that are on the boards. This likely will not happen anymore because of COVID, but um, this was supposed to be a pavilion along the Chicago River Walk. And um, we began with an existing structure that an artist who had won the commission the year before had left behind. Um, and so our idea was to reuse his structure, but to create a new environment with the structure. So we took the most efficient shape that we could build on top of this existing structure, which is a pyramid and then created different um, atmospheres underneath it. And we call this project, Give Me a Minute, Please, um, to create a space for people to kind of stop and rest along the Chicago River Walk. And um, this is also a new project of ours. This is the renovation and addition to 
a very large, um, basically mansion on the outskirts of Chicago. Um, it's by a locally famous architect called Howard Van Doren Shaw, um, who built a lot of homes in the northern suburbs of Chicago and um, was a contemporary of Frank Lloyd Wright, though um, much less known. Um, but he, he is known for being um, uh, the most radical of the conservatives. So it's a very interesting home uh, to be working with. And it's quite large. It's 12, 1,200 square meters for one family. Um, and so we were given this existing large home and cabana to work with and to create. Um, we're, we're doing a bunch of little interventions throughout the home, but then the main thing was also to create a connection between this cabana and the rest of the home. And so our idea is to work with um, a, a geometry that's familiar with a lot of Howard Van Dorenshaw's work, which is the archway, and to create a connection between the original home and the cabana um, at the back of the home. And then lastly, um, this is a new project we just started working on. It's for um, an artist's studio on a, as an addition to a very typical Chicago graystone. Um, and so the idea here is to create this public pathway through the home uh, for visitors to the, the artist's studio uh, and to a more formal exhibition space at the back. Um, so the home is both for the artist working and producing and living, as well as for showing his art. And so at the top, um, this kind of ends in a uh, uh, collision of different geometries for, for different ways of lighting the art and um, creating different spaces for the artist to you know, have a smoke break under, um, but also to show the art. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And you were also uh, in almost Swiss in terms of, not almost, really Swiss in terms of timing, 29 minutes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can uh, stop sharing the screen so that I can take a couple of words before we welcome uh, Jens Kasper. Jens Kasper is a German architect based in Berlin. He uh, is also a professor in uh, Cottbus University, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe he will correct me if I'm wrong. That's the last time, at least when we met. Uh, maybe he already ch changed. And then he uh, was a part of an architectural company called uh, Kasper Müller van Severen. And now, if I'm not mistaken, he's a... not correct. Not correct. <laughs> It's no, but, not Van Zeveren. So it's Kasper Müller Knea was the name. Kasper Müller Knea. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Van Zeveren uh, is another guy. Okay, I'm I'm not uh, reading it. I I'm mis um, mistaken, uh, Jens. I'm sorry, but and um, Don't worry. but uh, currently Jens is practicing himself, and um, I met uh, thanks to our common friend Louise Rellensman, who is um, a German. Um, architectural historian and journalist. And um, she introduced uh, me to Jens, we became friends and uh, I was uh, completely mesmerized. I, I visited only one building by Jens, but it's a, a real masterpiece. I can say 100% uh, sure. Unfortunately, I haven't seen his beautiful work in South Korea and in, in, in London, but I have seen pictures, it's, it's very amazing. And um, uh, the project I'm, I was uh, speaking about is Boris Bunker, which I hope Jens will show today. Um, Jen, with maybe Jens, if I don't know if I f forgot some of your regalia, please correct me. And uh, we welcome uh, Jens Kasper today with us. Sorry, I was not, I was not, um, I, we have it written in our uh, brief, but I did not put it in front of my eyes. So maybe I made some uh, fa factual mistakes. It's all fine. It's all fine. Thank you for having me. And I'm sharing screen now. No? And which one do I share? Desktop number two. 
If you have questions, guys, we will ask them afterwards. Are you seeing the full screen now? Yes, okay. Thank you for having me. And uh, I'm not a professor anymore. They didn't want me in any university. Now I'm too old. I have been working as a professor for years, um, also in Cottbus, but currently I'm more like a private person. <laughs> um, but the last thing I've been teaching was in Myanmar, and I'm very worried and struggled uh, these days, I have to say, because we have a lot of friends in Myanmar, and they are all on the run and hiding. So. It's true, I have been working with Kaspar müller kneer It's this yellow here, up here. Do, do you see my mouse? Yes. And uh, I've been founding uh, several offices and I'm not a partner of any of those anymore, uh, but you will find them on the web. Um, I've been also teaching uh, for uh, a lot of years at TU Berlin and in Cottbus and with the AA and um, on several occasions. Today I'm going to present uh, uh, three projects. One is more like a theoretical project, the Garage Manifest, which I'm doing together with Louise Reinsmann, which is my partner in crime, a White Cube in London, and the Boros Collection, which is the bunker project that you've been talking about. Um, the Garage Manifesto is the more is the latest one. We are going to publish it in September. Uh, and it's about the relation of preservation and architecture, architectural intervention and design and heritage preservation. Um, the garage manifesto is mainly about a very ugly building typology. Is these garages that we knew from traveling uh, the former eastern part of Germany, uh, GDR. So Germany was divided until 1989. Um, the left and colorful part is uh, the former West Germany. And uh, this was the communist part, as you would say, with Berlin as an island here. And Cottbus, this red dot here. Traveling the former GDR, DDR, you will find these garages. And we knew that we had a complex of these garages close to our university. The campus is here in Cottbus and we knew these garages here and we thought that they might be a good uh, topic for a seminar which we led uh, three and a half years ago. And uh, what you see here is the roof or the roofscape of these uh, all these boxes and um, we searched, we used uh, Google Maps to search other of these complexes in Cottbus. And they are all different, but they are very unique in their roof pattern and easy to find. And um, every of the students of this seminar was 12 students, picked one of those garage complexes. This one was in Eisenhüttenstadt with more than 1000 garages. Um, Uh, and had the task to describe their garage complex as a, as a narrative, like a design. Um, we handed out uh, some some form sheet uh, for them just to uh, just as a starter to find a, to find a, a narration, and then they they went to the sites and uh, took pictures, drawings, and they were forced to do short texts and what they found is like huge uniformity but also a huge variety of colors and forms also uses uh, like a bar or uh, workshops uh, were uh, complementary parts of these garage complexes and additions and um, different materials uh, different roof tiles different gates uh, different rain pipe systems and fixtures. We didn't know what they are good for, like these wind hooks, and uh, also uh, repair stands within these complexes. And some of the garages were open. Usually, the owners would not allow the students to photograph the inside of these garages. And often, we found bikes. These garages, as we found out, were built by the users themselves uh, like 
in a in a in a move to build up socialism in the former GDR between the 1960s and the 1980s, and they often were not erected close to the to the homes of the people. Most of the people were living in uh, slab buildings. Um, and they used their bikes to get to the garage, changed to the car and moved to, I don't know where. Um, we discussed our findings in the studio together with uh, architectural and heritage manifestos. So we compared the repair stands with uh, uh, Venice window frames um, drawn by John Ruskin in the 19th century. And um, from the very beginning, we um, tried to create material what, which was publishable and, uh, and um, we wanted to do an exhibition, which was like a vague idea, which later became truth. Uh, so the students had to draw like, black, uh, like figure ground plans, axonometries. They all used the same trees. This one is a complex which has a football pitch as its core. Uh, one student draw, uh, drew all the locks of the garages, different locks, and um, one student was able to open a garage and uh, uh, describe the interior of the garage of a former Olympian. Um, I don't know what sport he did. I think he was a swimmer, but I'm not sure. So, and then we had the opportunity to show the garage manifesto. Uh, so the student work in a renowned gallery in um, Berlin on Karl Marx Allee. This is the gallerist Ulrich Müller and uh, the students, the proud students on a stage we found um, with the logo, with our logo in the back, um, the exhibition with all the findings, uh, which was uh, very well visited. And we staged a discussion with uh, architects and preservationists. Um, and we are very happy to be able to publish it with Park Books, which is also a Swiss publishing house in uh, September. We, we aimed for June, but we didn't match it. So these are uh, pages the designer has done so far. Uh, it will be extended, the findings will be extended um, or complemented with a visual essay of a renowned photographer um, of lost GDR, uh, let's say, and a text about the relation between architectural design and heritage preservation. As um, Leonie mentioned earlier, uh, my, my partner, or she's not my wife because we are not married, um, because this, this is something, something she doesn't want. <laughs> um, but we have a kid together, we're living together, and uh, she's a preservationist, and she hates she hates preservationists um, or the attitude of preservation in general, the institutional preservation, but discussing preservation as a, um, we try to discuss preservation as a, as, as we are more and more talking about interventions in, in already existing buildings, we were discussing preservation as a tool of progressive architectural design. Um, and we think that it should be taught as, uh, as, as a kind of a regular um, architectural theory, um, the methods of preservation, and, the, uh, and the, as well as the uh, discourse on preservation. Um, on the other hand, uh, we always had to st uh, stop the students from changing the, uh, the garages. Uh, so the student group was uh, very hetero heterogene, it was it were architects and urban designers and uh, regional planners and uh, also uh, heritage preservationists and the architects, they all wanted to change the situation from the very beginning. And we tried to stop them from doing so by having a serious look at the situation at their garages. They were like uh, resisting it, but uh, in the beginning, but the results are kind of a piece of design in itself, uh, simply by looking at the things um, and without the attitude of changing them before having a closer look. Um, 
the second project I'm going to shoot through is uh, White Cube in London. It's an old project, so I'm. Uh, it was uh, finished in 2011, and it was a one-year project. It was the reason why Casper Müller Kneer was founded um, uh, as an office between London and Berlin. Uh, we did a couple of projects together, but we uh, separated last year. So there was no more, we had no more base, um, which happens. And I hope this will not happen to uh, Alison and Lab soon. Um, White Cube is a contemporary art gallery. It's, they are art dealers. Uh, so they are not um, showing art uh, from a cultural perspective, but uh, arts for them is a trade good. Um, and they uh, have warehouses stacked with art pieces, and they have these gallery spaces where they show every piece as a, like a singularity, something which is very unique and um, something very uh, very unique. They were looking for a new warehouse uh, and found one in uh, south of the Thames. So uh, the uh, old city of London is here, London Bridge. And uh, here, uh, this is Bermondsey Street. There is an old warehouse or they found an old warehouse, which is completely built within the fabric here with a small courtyard in the front and office block here. And this is the two roofs of the warehouse and they initially were only looking for warehouse and had the idea of having a small gallery within it but during the process um, the uh, the gallery grew and the warehouse uh, area shrank so it became more a museum like gallery that was the entrance uh, in 2010 how we found it in the small courtyard in the front and that's the inside of one, one of the arches, uh, one of two arches of this warehouse, um, warehousing space. The offices are above here. Um, yeah, that was the appearance from the street. So what we have here is one of the initial sketches, uh, like weeks after uh, the first meeting and after the, after the first uh, site visit. Uh, what you see is like. Uh, a shared front yard here. And then there is a, an element we call the spatial divider uh, and a long corridor um, to get into the depth of the building. Oops, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and gallery spaces here and surrounded by warehouse spaces. Um, and an initial sketch showing how this warehouse is going to be built into the, uh, how these gallery spaces are going to be built into the warehouse and sometimes also protruding the roof. Um, we ne I need to say that the warehouse is rented only for 15 years. So the lease is going to end somehow soon. And I don't know what is going to happen then uh, with all this. So this is uh, the floor plan. It's uh, very simple. You have the corridor here, that's the front yard. Um, uh, like a small foyer situation here, a bookshop and uh, a small cinema down here, and then huge gallery spaces at the side here. And these gallery spaces are uh, private viewing rooms that are only open for um, rich customers with uh, individual uh, exhibitions. Was there someone talking? No. So that's a drawing of the front yard and that's the new appearance. So a new roof was uh, necessary and it is uh, entirely cantilevered up here, down here. So the facade also was redone um, with the original bricks we found. And that's the uh, front yard uh, used during um, opening. So it's crowded. That was before Corona, of course, and uh, during the day or when there is no opening, uh, you see the, the shared function here. So this is like a truck. Uh, Hasenkamp is a huge 
uh, art dealing company. And that's the entrance to the corridor, um, which is 60, 70 meters long with the cinema in the end. And then we have these museum spaces. This one is a nine by nine by nine meters box, which was uh, supposed to have daylight, but daylight is uncontrollable. So this is like a room where there is a lot of lighting technique up here, almost blacking out all of the daylight, simulating daylight. Um, and white cube is programmatic architectonically in itself. So the floor was more or less given a concrete floor, white walls. And the architectural element, besides um, uh, 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 the geometry of the spaces, is like the way the light is elaborated. This is the more experimental uh, way that uh, the, this one is only in the corridor. And for the, uh, we had the daylight, and this one is the experimental one. Anthony Gormley here. And then Anthony Gormley in the big space. And this is the same space with an Anselm Kiefer uh, exhibit. And of course, these spaces are uh, dividable. This was the opening exhibition. And this is a view into the private viewing rooms. And the warehouse itself, there are no photos of the warehouse in use, but it looks almost like that. And that is a photo taken in one of the old uh, warehouses uh, White Cube had before, like full of boxes. So that's White Cube. And this is uh, Zamlon Boros. So when the first project, the first, uh, the Raj Manifesto was about interpretation and close look. The second project was an addition. And this one here is more or less about subtraction of matter. Um, it was built by a rather famous architect during Second World War, uh, World War Germans, uh, started with an idea, an imperialistic idea um, of uh, conquering the whole world. And uh, these bunkers were built in thousands over Germany to protect uh, the people from air raids. Um, this picture is taken by Wolfgang Tillmanns, a famous photographer. Um, showing the exterior in the beginning of the 90s. Um, it was a club location. Um, it was the uh, place where the uh, love parade was initiated, if anyone remembers what that is. Um, it was the home of techno in Berlin. Uh, and um, when you look at the uh, reason why the building is uh, protected heritage and listed is only because of its uh, uh, Nazi architecture. Um, but when we started to deal with the uh, building, we also were interested in the afterlife, so after the war. So the, the building was uh, finished in 1943, in 1945, the, war was over and um, it was used as a storage building uh, for uh, 40 years, 30 years, 40 years almost, and then um, turned into the club. And then it was empty and an art collector bought it um, in 2003. This is the section through the building. So that building also was a type building. It was uh, not built that often. Um, and uh, the one we found or we transformed was the only one left. Um, it has five stories and a one meter and 80 outer wall concrete. And this is a three meter concrete roof. This is also an old plan showing the one meter and 80 wall here and the symmetrical layout uh, with uh, like these niches on the inside, staircases, four of them, four entrances, and a ring of spaces, um, housing toilets or uh, doctor medical rooms and stuff like that. 
uh, an upper floor, same layout. You have these four stairs and the interior ring and the uh, ring of uh, well, hardware uses. And um, these are pictures taken by a friend photographer uh, shortly after the building was purchased, um, showing like all the same rooms, different colors and machinery that we found. And a really early model of the potential interventions inside the building and a later model and a one-to-one -one model of a specific situation on the uh, on the of the apartment on top of the building and 3d models that we that we did to uh, control the interventions that we planned and tests we had to do so uh, A lot of the buildings that we find or that we have to that we are intervening in um, are not built according to the actual norms. Um, so in this case, uh, according to the norm, the sh building should have been collapsed when we do cuts into the ceilings, um, and we had to do a test to prove the norm wrong. Um, so there were times during the, uh, the design when we were thinking about uh, reinforcing the concrete uh, of the bunker, um, but we were happy to find that this is not necessary. So um, this, uh, this construction, which is shown here, um, uh, had the task to break one of the ceilings to find out the load it could actually carry after cutting through the uh, reinforcement. And the machinery was not able to find the load. It would break itself. So the concrete was uh, has a, has a um, sturdity which is beyond any means in terms of finding out how much it is. But the norm says it does not. Um, it would not uh, take your load. So there is a huge. This is not the only uh, gap we found between norm and actual uh, situation. So there is a, a lot of testing you have to do on site. So this is a diagrammatical drawing. This is the, re we had to refurbish the whole facade. Technically, um, this is the ceiling we turned into a landscape, a new uh, staircase and elevator element we had to introduce. That's a new apartment on the rooftop and the spaces we created by taking away matter and a new uh, exhibition uh, circulation that was introduced. Diggers on top and heavy substruction until we did have this hole here for the staircase and uh, the elevator mm -hmm. to the roof and the same uh, in, on the inside of the building. These lights are uh, drills and the light we see is sunlight coming down. We also we see the same drills down here. Uh, these ceilings uh, ceilings are supposed to be removed, and that's all the uh, material that we removed from the inside of the building. Um, it was not intended to be reused on site, and uh, the new apartment on top. Uh, that's the hole here behind these new walls and the entrance. This is uh, supposed to be the kitchen. The living area is going through all the entire space. And this is a uh, bathroom, bathroom, guest room, children's room and uh, parents uh, sleeping. A new uh, small niche for a working space and this is the fireplace. So, uh, of course, the building has been transformed, but we try to keep uh, traces of all the uses, like this cross here we saw before uh, from the um, cross, Red Cross Club. Um, and this is what we did with the spaces. So we, we removed uh, ceilings and walls to create uh, a spatial 
um, the space flowing throughout the whole building. And um, yeah, this is from the first exhibition. A lot of the art pieces in there were uh, done precisely for the site uh, that this uh, piece by Monika Zosnowska fits a door here perfectly. Uh, this one is an Olafur Eliasson from the first exhibition, and that's an Ai in the same room. This was the only room which had a piece before the, uh, the first exhibition, and that was this um, ventilator here. Um, its dimensions were known, and we had to take away two the uh, ceilings. The rest was done uh, uh, more or less to, to create a, a spatial sculpture, a sculpture. And we were happy to be able to also influence this sculpture on site. So we had our models and 3D models and a final design approved by the client. And we started uh, taking away ceilings and the whole um, uh, recognition of the space of the space we were working in was collapsing and recreating itself and we thought like no we have to do it differently so we had we had drawn a lot of decisions on site which was great and um, I think should be during uh, reuse projects uh, this is something we experience all the time and this is the new elevator element um, which uh, is connecting ground floor to the uh, roof level. And the stair upstairs, and that's the floor plan of uh, the apartment on top. We talked about this before, fireplace, bathrooms and bedroom area. This is the living room and the kitchen elevated. And that's a view of the uh, living room, which is a mix of a gallery space, museum space and living room, two steps up to the kitchen. And that's the fireplace, which we found out uh, would work not with the one-to-one -one model we saw earlier, uh, would not work when without this little pedestal here, um, it was, we, were, we would have not been able to uh, operate this chimney or this fireplace. Exactly, looking back. And uh, this is the corner here behind. This is the living area. And through here, you're going to the um, smaller living room area. And that's the garden surrounding the uh, apartment. The roof is continuous. Of course, this roof is uh, suspended and there is only one column we don't have what we have is a absolutely column free space as you see here there is one column here um, and the rest is the rest of the load is taken by the walls of course into uh, in our walls and by the facade so the facade profiles are load bearing um, we found out that the dimension of a load bearing facade profile uh, would not have been bigger than a regular uh, aluminum profile, only talking, uh, taking the wind load. So that's the steel columns here. Yes. And that's it from the outside. That's the facade. So we had these issues here during to sloppy construction and the age um, pieces fell down to the street. So we had to walk this facade like, I don't know, 20 times and find all these, uh, uh, all these um, broken, broken uh, parts of the facade and refurbish those. So we didn't do anything else. And that was it from my part. I don't know what we have here. That's another project I don't want to show. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you. Uh, let's the time now. Get six as well. Another super precise presentation. Thirty minutes exactly. Does anyone have questions to our guests about their work? Okay, Elsa, please. Uh, it's a question for Jen, but it's not really about your work, but more about your background, like your literally your, your actual background. 
there's a few letters behind you, like an L and an E, and maybe an S or a C, and I was just wondering uh, if you have an anecdote about the letters that on your background. So, so sorry, so I didn't get the question. You, uh, somebody... Look to the right, look to the right. She's asking about these letters. Look to the right now. No, literally, look to the right. Yes, it's more. Ah, right. the letters behind me. L E O. Yeah. It's Leonid. No, I, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it was saying hotel once. And I have a son whose name is Leo. And we, um, gave this as a birthday present to him. It can be lit in different colors. So that's it. <laughs> that's, thank you. Okay. Anyone else? <laughs> Elsa is a graphic designer, so it can explain why she's in <laughs> letters. I, I was wondering, what is she talking about? My background is like my background. Interestingly, my background is uh, is um, working class and uh, parts of my family has been working for the German railways and they have been doing jobs like living in these small houses and running the tracks and uh, checking if they are correct, uh, if they are fine. Hmm. Hmm. So. <laughs> Okay, guys, uh, probably you're all very tired. They, some of them said they slept half an hour. <laughs> so we apologize them for the absence of questions. Although our uh, guests are super amazing and super interesting architects. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much for your uh, critique and um, good luck. See you. Unfortunately, you didn't come in person, but next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Ciao. 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 Uh, what? Uh, recording. Ah. You, you do it. Uh, but it will ask you, I guess. Uh, it will uh, pause. No? Oh, stop. Stop. Oh, sure. so, yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.